Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second meeting of the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. I am recreating the magic from but an hour or so ago when I apparently did not hit record for the first 15 minutes or so of our session. So I'm just going to cover what I covered at that time and get things started. Speaking of getting things started, we started last week uh, in our first session about accessibility. And that session was fast, it was a bird's eye view, and that will generally be true in Pub 101. We're not digging too deeply or holding how-to sessions, but really rather introducing topics for you to consider as you think about support supporting OER publishing. The idea here is that you can get oriented to some core topics and then find a community for ongoing support when you're doing what it is uh, you need to do. One example of a community would be the publishing cooperative. Other examples are the library publishing forum, the Rebus community, or colleagues on your campus. I encourage you to please revisit the alt tag homework and shared class notes documents from last week. Elle did take time to respond to your questions and um, offer some feedback on your alt tags. And later in the hour, if we have a few minutes, Elle may um, further sort of uh, contribute uh, to the conversation around accessibility. So this week, the original plan was to talk about planning a publishing program. But as we all know, sometimes plans do not always go as planned. And so since Amanda had a dental emergency, um, she's going to join us next week. And this week, we are lucky to have Karen Bjork, Head of Digital Initiatives and Scholarly Publishing at Portland State University Library, who is overseeing the publication of many textbooks. She is going to talk about building publishing programs and doing so through the call for proposals. But first, you're going to hear us start talking a lot about project managers now. And I would like to just briefly cover what it is project managers do. And the short answer is, of course, a lot. There's a long list of things, and that long list can sometimes be overwhelming. But I wanted you to know that when we talk about project managers in Pub 101, we are talking about you. Uh, you are the audience for Pub 101, uh, librarians, instructional designers, and others who are supporting faculty authors in writing open textbooks. And the same is true of the publishing curriculum that we're using in Pub 101. Of course, part of defining your project management role will emerge as you define your program more broadly. For example, maybe you're going to provide access to press books and ask faculty authors to let you know once they've written a book there. Uh, or perhaps you'll take it one step further in that model and decide to offer press books training to a group of faculty authors. Maybe after seeing what they've published, you decide, you know what, this is our um, institutionally branded instance of press books. I would like to see these projects um, proofread or copy edited, which um, would be an additional um, service that your publishing organization would provide. Maybe you will be working with students to copy and paste from the authoring documents to the publication platform. There are a lot of different things that you might end up doing as a project manager. And so um, I encourage you to sort of note with each step or each decision, you know, who is going to be doing this? Does this fall to the project manager? Or am I um, organizing or coordinating this work? And what kind of capacity do I have? So as a project manager, you're also uh, going to be involved in creating the call for proposals or CFP for short. So we're going to get into a call for proposals a state of mind uh, with a quick exercise. And um, I have in the past referred to the call for proposals as a matchmaking tool. And so extending that metaphor, I would like you to think about the call for proposals as just that. And in that spirit, create a dating profile, if you will, or a personal ad for what kind of collaborator you're looking for when you um, send out your call for proposals. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to introduce this reflective exercise.
So uh, I would like to point out the project manager uh, represented here in this vintage Valentine. Of course, we all like to give the impression that in spite of everything we have to do, whenever we're working um, with someone on a collaborative project, say a faculty author, they are always top of mind and we're not going to forget about them. And you will probably be writing many letters and check-ins um, as part of this process. So, um, I'm now going to share a couple examples of the call for proposals as a matchmaking tool. I think this is a fun entry point and fun reflective exercise to just stop and consider what you have to offer and what you're looking for, rather than sort of jumping into more heady language that you'll find in a call for proposals. This kind of just gives you a little bit of grounding. So imagine you're perfect or at least you're a good enough match. Uh, you might write something like this. Organized project manager seeks laid back but reliable faculty author to explore new OER publishing support ideas. Ideally, you're comfortable with ambiguity and not easily ruffled. Now, of course, in our work lives, we can't always choose um, who we're working with, but I will say that there are many publishing programs that get started through word of mouth and through relationships. And so if you have a good relationship with someone, a faculty member who you enjoy working with, and they're saying, hmm, I might want to try this, that could be a really great place to start to pilot your program with someone who you know you work well with. A second example, you, eager to try something new and collaborate as partners. Me, clear communicator with lots of ideas, but not a lot of time. Together, we figure out how to publish OER. So I really like framing um, relationships as partnerships or collaborations as partnerships. When working professionally, I think this can help clarify expectations about who is doing what. And um, it can sometimes help you from feeling like you're in a position of just doing all the stuff that the other person doesn't want to do. Um, you can define that together, that collaboration or that partnership together. And finally, uh, for a different type of uh, publishing program, you're already familiar with Creative Commons licenses. You've got an OER draft ready, and you just need some support getting it out there. Me, I've got an editor's eye and an institutional repository. So maybe it's too soon for you to be involved, or maybe you never want to be involved in the development of an OER um, tool or an open textbook. And it's very possible that there's someone out there who already has a textbook draft and they're just looking for a way to disseminate it and get it out there. And you and the library are probably in a great position to help them. So this could also be uh, your personal ad. So for the next five minutes, I would like you to draft your own, reflect on your perfect match or your good enough match for um, launching your OER project or program, and also think about what you can offer them. I'll let you know when the five minutes has passed. And then we will move into small groups to share our dating profiles. Hey everybody, welcome back. I am sorry for uh, the group that I think was, was cut the most short, but um, I hope that that was a, a useful exercise. I would love um, for you to put anything in the chat, any um, takeaways or any particularly creative personal ads you may have heard, um, please feel free to share that in the chat from your group. Um, at the same time, I'm going to do a quick poll before handing things over to Karen. Um, Susan, I'm glad you had fun. I hope um, that was the case uh, for, for some others too. So, um, the poll that you should be seeing now, if you are launching an open textbook publishing program, where are you at in your plans? Are you early? You have good intentions. You're talking about it, thinking about it. Are you midway? You've identified funding, if possible, and what you want from the program. Or are you ready? You set a date. You're going to launch a call for proposals. This is totally happening. Uh, let us know. Second, if you have ever created a call for proposals, this could be for anything. It doesn't have to be publishing. Of course, if, that, if you have, that skill will be transferable to the publishing world. And then number three, if you have created a call for proposals, have you ever received responses that didn't quite fit what you were looking for and you thought, hmm, 
where, where did this person come from with this particular idea? Or maybe you wanted to respond to a call for proposals and you felt there were some big gaps in like, what is it they want from me exactly? Um, it looks like uh, the majority of you are early, you have good ten intentions and are talking about starting a program. Um, it's almost half and half with slightly more of you having some experience creating a call for proposals in some sort of program. And yes, uh, half of you have received responses for a CFP that weren't quite a fit. So um, there are the results there. Um, Karen, I hope that gives you some background on our crowd here. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand things over to you to talk more about call for proposals, what you've learned, how you've structured it. As I mentioned earlier, Karen's head of digital initiatives and scholarly publishing at Portland State University Library. And Karen, with that, please uh, take it away. All right, so hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes. Awesome, so I'm gonna share my screen. So just give me a second here, okay. So you all should, if my slide, there we go. It's loading. All right, so everyone should be able to see my slide. Okay, perfect. So um, as Karen said, um, I am talking to all of you about essentially setting expectations of your publishing program uh, through your call for proposal. So as Karen said, I am the head of digital initiatives and scholarly publishing at uh, Portland State University. Um, I manage the institutional repository PDX Scholar and I lead the university's open access textbook publishing initiative PDX Open. Um, as a project lead, I am fully invested in ensuring that all of our faculty authors have a positive experience and that they're able to successfully complete their open textbook projects and uh, since the inception of PDX Open, we have published 21 faculty author open access textbook projects, and this summer it'll be 22. So I'm very excited about all of that. But we have had a lot of bumps and thumps and restarts along the way. So uh, I'll kind of walk you through. So I wanted just to kind of uh, focus on capacity, in particular with call for proposal. So really capacity informs your program design. And I know Amanda is gonna be talking a lot about this, so I'm gonna go through this slide really quickly. Um, but your call for proposal really does communicate your program design. And you wanna think about your call for proposal as your first opportunity to communicate your programmatic capacity and author's expectations. So the call for proposal really provides your program the opportunity to set priorities and expectations. The call for proposal is typically how faculty first learn about your program and what you have to offer. So if you're, it's like you're, you know, as Karen was saying, it's really kind of that dating profile. It helps you shape what your program is able to offer. It sets the overall tone and it really defines the spirit of the project. And if there's anything that I want all of you to sort of have as a takeaway in, after this presentation is the term spirit of your project. It has been one of the best terms I have used throughout my entire program. And it really has allowed me to have this discussion with faculty about are their projects meeting the spirit of the project and we can go back to that call of proposal and say here is that spirit here is what you signed up for so i do think it's really really um, one of the best words it's kind of like when you're an archivist and you hear it depends in open textbook publishing i always like to say it's whatever the spirit of the project is and i learned that actually from a, a project manager friend of mine um, so in your call of proposal, it is very important to be clear and provide detailed information about what courses, disciplines, and who your publishing program will be targeting. You also want to be able to communicate expectations. So what is the length of time for the books? Um, how many check-ins will authors have to go and um, participate in workshops? You also want to include budget. How much funding will authors get? Will there be course buyouts, for example? 
You'll want to include publishing services your program will be offering or publishing services your program will not be offering. Uh, you will also want to talk about the selection criteria. Are there going to be required, uh, you know, is there anything that faculty will be required to, to prove or to provide? Um, and then as well, what does your end product look like? Again, spirit of the project. What are you expecting out of all of this? So the call, the call for proposal will also help you inform your author agreement, which is another piece of um, Publishing 101 that you'll be going through in a couple weeks. So to get started, how, where, where do you even get started? So for me, when I first started, I had no idea. I'd never written a call for proposal before in my life. And I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. So I just went to the internet and I found other call for proposals. Now there's a lot out there, um, but they're definitely a good starting point. And the other recommendation that I always have is draft and revise. Draft your call for proposal, send it out to uh, faculty that you know who might be interested and see if they have any questions. Is it clear? Do you feel like you could answer all the questions? Is there anything else you would like to see? And when I talk about revise, I really mean going back. So you're going to do your first round, put your call for proposal out. Before you do another round, re-look at your call for proposal. What did you miss? Did you get some of those faculty grants or applications that you were like, why did we get this? Where did this come from? Or did you find as you went through the project, you're like, oh, I wish we would have included this in our call for proposal. So always, always revise. Every time we've done a new call for proposal, we pretty much have started from scratch and have actually uh, wrote a new one. So our call for proposal started off really small and now it's like over a page long. Um, just because we want to ensure that all those expectations are being met. So priorities and check-ins. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, before you release your call for proposal, you'll want to think about and decide what the focus of your grant program will be. This is really, really important. So you'll need to ask yourself, who will you be encouraging to apply? Will you be encouraging faculty who teach first year courses, um, high enrollments, or those, who or those who teach a particular discipline or area. So for example, our last call for proposal at Portland State, we wanted to target high enrollment courses. So we designed our call for proposal around that goal. But one thing we quickly learned was that the university didn't have a clear definition of what high enrollment course meant. So we had to do a bunch of digging and try to figure out, you know, what, what do faculty think about when they hear high enrollment? And how can we then put that within our call for proposal? And it did take a bit of work. I mean, we really had to make sure that we were really, really clear on what we, on, on how we were defining high enrollment. And in the end for us, we defined high enrollment as approximately 500 students annually. Um, but those decisions really shape your call for proposal. They also shape your budget. If you only have, for example, $10,000, and you want to go and target high enrollment courses, for example, you need to figure out how much money are you giving to each of the faculty? Are you only giving them $2,500 or are you giving them $8,000 or $10,000? And that will really sort of, you know, have you figure out or attempt to figure out, you know, who are your priorities gonna be and how are you going to select the, um, the, the proposals that come through. Um, you will also, it'll also help you shape who is on your selection committee. So we have a committee that goes through all of our proposals and they always look at the call for proposal to, do, you know, to make sure they know what they should be looking for. Um, it is also important, um, the call for proposals, it's important to help you build the community and uh, sort of have check-ins built in. So in our call for proposals, we have required, or we've put down that participants uh, are going to be uh, participating in individual check-ins. Um, they must participate in at least three individual check-ins throughout their entire grant program. They also have to participate in workshops. Um, other call for proposals I have seen have integrated group monthly meetings um, as well. And all of this is included in your call for proposal. Um, you want to be able to make sure grantees know how they're going to share their successes, how they're going to be able to talk about their challenges. 
Um, it's really important because um, a lot of authors I have found end up getting stuck when they start working on their, their projects. So having sort of those check-ins, having the workshop really is a great opportunity to make sure they get started. But you also, the authors also have to know that they will be required to participate. And if they don't participate, are there going to be ramifications? And how are you going to deal with that? Um, if they can't participate for some reasons or they're not willing to, you can always go back to your call for proposal and say, well, this is what the, the you know, this is what our program had required and you applied knowing those things. Um, I make it sound like, you know, you always have to go back, but it is really good um, because you will run into problems or you will run into potential issues down the road where you may have to think about uh, essentially saying goodbye to one of your authors and you really need to make sure you're clear on what you're doing and why and the expectations that you had set. So author's expectations. This is extremely, it's huge and I can't stress this enough. You need to, authors need to know what to expect. It's sort of that what to expect um, when expecting. It's that dating profile. What are they getting into? Um, so it is really, I'm, I'm going to say this again, you need to really clearly define the role of the author. Will authors not, will authors be authors and editors or will they just be the authors? Who will be helping them make pedagogical de uh, decisions? Will authors be required to find images and figures and figure out the copyright permissions? Who's gonna be clearing permissions? Are you going to put that on the author or are you going to, as a program, help them and assist with that? Um, and there are other several things to also think about is what are your in-house expertise? So do you have anybody in your program that could be a copy editor or that could do the design? Or do you have somebody that has copyright uh, expertise that would be willing to step in and fill in that role? How will you handle reviews? Uh, will authors be expected to send out their manuscript to reviewers, or is that something you're going to handle? How many reviewers do authors need to have? Are they going to be blind reviews? Are they going to be open? Um, at Portland State, we require authors to, uh, to find their reviewers. Um, all the reviews are open, so the authors know who they are. It's really um, more so about getting feedback. But the author, but two of the reviewers cannot be affiliated with our institution. We only, the only uh, they have to have two outside reviewers and then they can have one inside reviewer. And the reason we decided to do that is just because we don't have the capacity or the expertise in the fields to be able to select reviewers. I really depend on the authors to be able to find that. Um, as well as we really want our books to be used and taught outside of our institution. So it's really great to get that feedback because Portland State's on terms. So many of our books are designed for terms rather than semesters. So that's also something we need to be aware of. Um, we also need to talk about, where am I here? Oh, here we go. Will authors be required to set aside a certain amount of money for design? So if you um, are saying to your authors, you have $5,000, but you have to set aside $2,500 for design, for example. Um, or you, you say to your authors, you have $5,000, here's your $5,000, take it and do with it as you please. Does your university have stipulations about how money can be spent? Um, I'll be talking a bit more about budget um, in the next couple slides, but it is something you'll need to and think about wanting to include in your call for proposal. So it's really about trying to balance expectations and overall um, sort of ideas so that you, so people know what they're getting into. Writing a textbook sounds like it's an easy prospect sometimes, but let me tell you, it is not. And managing textbooks can be even more difficult. So you just, it, it sounds like you're scaring people off, but in my opinion, I'd rather scare people off then have somebody come in and not be fully prepared and ready to really put in the hard work and not really know or have an expectation of how much money they'll be receiving um, for doing this work. All right, so final product and timeline. Uh, authors, you have to ask yourself, will authors retain the copyright or will the copyright be transferred to the university? So when we originally started our program, the authors had to give their 
copyright to the university. And I can tell you it was a problem. Uh, we were able to work with the university council. So now our authors are able to keep and retain their copyright. We do put Creative Commons license on the work. Um, but we always, so always check with your legal counsel before uh, you move forward, particularly with your call for proposal and how they're going to want to handle the copyright. Um, you need to also think about what Creative Commons license uh, you will allow. Are you going to allow non-derivative um, as a Creative Commons license? Or is that, or, or are you going to say, no, all of our books will only have a CC BY or a CC BY NC or a CC BY NCSA? You'll want to uh, include what a completed textbook looks like. This is where we ran into problems in our first round. I didn't include this. And it was very interesting to discover that uh, the expectation of a textbook was very different for some of my authors. Um, one of my authors ended up giving me a reader's package, uh, but they felt that that was a textbook because that was how they defined a textbook. So you do need to be clear about structures and styles. Um, are you going to sort of have number of pages, number of chapters? We just include a brief um, de definition of what we mean by a, a textbook. We don't actually say an author has to have a certain number of pages or a certain number of chapters, but that is something you may want to think or consider. And finally, how long are you gonna give authors to complete the project? Are you gonna do 18 months, two years? Are you gonna be flexible with your timeline? Does your funding allow you to be flexible with your timeline? So our first round of open textbooks, we were required the authors uh, finish their project within one year. Let me tell you, that was crazy. We should have never have done that, but we were on, you know, we got grant funding and the grant said the authors had to complete their books in a year. Uh, I was amazed at the number of authors that were able to do it, um, but we ran into some significant issues with some of our other authors. Um, we now say that authors have up to three years. Um, we are able to only pay our authors a small amount of money. We can't do buyout. So most of our authors are working on this uh, during the summertime. So just to make sure that we're really flexible and uh, that the authors can complete their book and be really proud of it, we've extended our deadline to three years. I actually have an author that uh, has been working on her book for five years. So yeah, flexibility, it's a really good thing. All right, budget. Um, as Karen knows, I could probably talk about budget for literally two hours. Uh, we deal we deal a lot with budget. Uh, budget in the open textbook program takes up probably most of my time. And the reason for that is because the library has decided that it's going to handle the administrative side of the budget. So we don't just give one lump sum to our authors. We say to the authors, create a budget spreadsheet, identify how you want the budget spent. We will work with you to get contracts signed up. Uh, we will work with you to figure out the best way to get the payments done. And the reason why we have done that is because of the fact of our university's requirements. Uh, the university pretty much said to us, um, you can't give people lump sum monies. You do need to figure out how to spread this out. Now for our smaller projects, we have um, adopt and adapt projects. Those we actually do uh, payments at the mid and end of project and we've gone and in included sort of check-ins in order for the payment details. Um, and that we've actually included in our call for proposal. So that's something to remember too. Our open textbook project call for proposal is different than our call for proposal for our adopt and adapt projects because of the way that the program is run. Uh, so you do need to think about how your money is going to be distributed. You need to talk and think through um, who, or who will cover other payroll expenses, known as OPE. Is the university going to cover it, or is the faculty member? So if you give a faculty member $3,000 over the summer, will that faculty member actually see $3,000, or will the faculty member see less than that because of OPE being taken out? We initially did not cover OPE, the university. Uh, we actually had that it came out of the author's uh, stipend, but we, uh, we realized that that was really not very fair to authors, so the university now covers it. So we have to, we have to uh, go and change our budget because of that, but we have put into our call for proposal that OPE will be covered by the university. 
Uh, so again, who will handle the contracts and what type of expenses will be paid? Is there anything that you're not going to allow? I will say that the library is very lucky at Portland State because we have a budget analyst. So she's able to go through and help me with a lot of this. Um, but it is, there's a lot there to really think about because you also want to make sure that you're not violating any HR issues with your university. Um, so we usually sit down with our HR folks before we release our call for proposal, talk to them about what we're wanting to do, how we're wanting to hire people. Um, you know, because of contracts, we, we have to hire people in the summer, which is another thing we put in our call for proposal. We let people know when they can actually do work. Um, and when I say we put all of this in our call for proposal, we have actually created a question and answer, a Q&A, that's part of our proposal. So a lot of this very sort of detail-orientated um, information is actually in that Q&A. And that Q&A has been growing as we've been continuing to do our call for proposal. So lessons learned. Create an FAQ, as I just said. Uh, so this will not only help you field your questions, it will also allow you to document the decisions that you've made. Um, have a clear selection criteria and rubric. So this is part of um, where your call for proposal really kicks in. Look at your call for proposal, be able to create that rubric that will help you have your selection. And it is okay to reject proposals, trust me. You want to make sure you get good, high quality proposals. You want to make sure that the authors know their expectations and that authors can complete their projects. If that is not clear within their proposal, it is okay to say, look, I'm so sorry, but your project or your proposal is not meeting our criteria, um, which is outlined in our call for proposal. Uh, it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to create awareness on your campus, and this has been really important for us, and I think this, this is why we've been able to continue our open text publishing program for as long as we have. Why should faculty participate in CARE? You really need to make sure you include that. What are the benefits of participating? What expertise as program managers do you bring to the program? And what opportunities for campus partnerships are there? Your program is going to become, a, you know, it's going to represent the university. The work that is getting published is going to be downloaded, it's going to be used, it's going to be viewed. And it's really great to be able to say, hey, look at what our faculty are doing, look at what they represent. It's, it's really cool. One of our most popular books is actually, um, has been downloaded over 100,000 times, and I'm still blown away by that. Um, but it really represents our project and who we are and what we're doing. So I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up because I can talk for a long time. Sorry, Karen. Um, so questions to consider. So do you want to evaluate writing samples as part of your application criteria? Do you want, uh, you know, to work with uh, multiple authors or just have a lead author? You know, beyond written text, what are you going to support? Are, do you have the capability to do illustrations, interactive experiences, websites? Um, will you provide tech report, uh, su project, uh, support? Will you provide tech support for your projects? Uh, do you require peer review? And do you want to ensure that someone else um, has reviewed the project before it's been published? For example, a copy editor or proofreader. And then I guess, should I end it here, Karen? Sure. Um, these are just, you know, reflections that uh, Karen and I wanted to leave you with, uh, with the call for proposals. Um, Karen, in the chat, you've been getting uh, appreciative feedback regarding uh, your presentation, especially some of the, some of the budget conversation. Um, there is one question that I will um, raise here, and please, everyone, feel free to post additional questions in the chat or unmute as we wind things up here with the hour. But Karen, do you want to talk a little bit about um, style guides? You mentioned early on that you were surprised how some authors defined textbook. And how do you handle that now? Do you have a set style guide or what do you recommend? Yeah, so we, um, I, don't, I wish I had the exact phrase um, here, but we actually use what the publishing co-op 
has used as a way to define uh, what an open textbook is. We essentially say that it has to have elements, that it has to have chapters, it has to have a table of contents. Um, so we do, we do explicitly say that now within our call for proposal. But the other thing that now that I do is when I do the check-ins with all of the, the faculty authors, they are required to bring their draft manuscripts. And we sit down and we start to look through their draft manuscripts um, during these check-ins. And that really then allows me to not only see where they're at, but it also um, can, if, if I do see any major issues or problems, I can point them out early on in the project. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, 22 textbooks is a lot. Does Portland State um, have OER as part of tenure and promotion? Or how, how have you gotten so many projects, I think is the subtext. <laughs> Luck. Uh, no, so uh, Portland State does not have uh, open textbook publishing as part of their tenure and promotion. Um, I, we have been really fortunate because most of our textbooks have actually come from the world languages. Uh, world languages were early adopters in open access textbook publishing. Many of the faculty had already had uh, manuscripts that they had been developing, and a lot of that was because of the fact that the pedagogical sort of teaching of languages has been shifting and changing really quickly, but the textbooks um, that were being offered had not, so a lot of those faculty were doing fill-ins. Um, we've also been really fortunate because we've had a lot of our provost was very supportive of our project. Um, and all of our funding um, has come from donors. So we have a foundation at Portland State. And so um, our funding is, is, is library donor funding as well as from the Alumni Association. Um, Portland State is also very much, I don't know how much a lot of you know about the university, but it is an urban campus. Um, it very, we have one of, I think our average age of our students is in their mid-20s. Um, so we have a lot of um, sort of older uh, students, students that are parents. And so there's been a lot of efforts in the last several years to really find ways to try to help reduce cost. And so the university has seen this as, as one of those means and has really done quite a lot for pushing, um, pushing it. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this next uh, budget in this new budget climate because we currently are out of our foundation funds for our open textbook projects. So I'm not certain when we'll be able to do our next round, which makes me very sad, but Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty right now um, There's a question from Veronica you mentioned the ever expanding frequently asked questions That you include with your call for proposals. Do you have a link to that or might you be able to send it later? Yeah, I'll be able to send that to, to Karen later. So we use it as sort of an internal document and then we publish it when we publish our call for proposal at the same time, but I'm happy to share that. Great, thank you. Are there other questions for Karen? Call for proposals? Feel free to unmute if you don't wanna type it in the chat. Okay, well, if you think of additional questions or you want to keep talking about what we talked about today, call for proposals, you know where to go, and that is the class notes. Uh, we have a meeting to section that we created, so if something comes to you later, um, let me know, and then I will um, follow up with you there um, with the link to the FAQs. Now, since we have four minutes left, I think it might be worth it to try to squeeze in any questions you might have for Elle, since she so generously um, is, is here with us again. Is there anything anyone would like to ask about accessibility or follow up on? As I mentioned, she did re respond to our homework um, alt tags and also um, in the class notes section, but I'll also invite you, Elle, if there's anything that you would like to, um, to say while we're all here. Sure, I could uh, pop in. I think Karen's point about style guides is a, is a good one. Like setting up those expectations when you're doing your CFP and including a either a general style guide or maybe working with your author creator 
to integrate a lot of those design decisions, including accessibility. And I think she raised a lot of great points about you know, who's going to track down the licensing, you know, is there an embargo period? All of those things kind of like need to be worked out. And maybe what kind of technical support you guys have or what kind of platform you might be using or what kind of tool. Maybe you're writing a textbook that's very specific to your discipline and you need a specific tool to you to be able to do that. Maybe it's a law tech markdown editor, right? Is that coming out of your uh, stipend or is that something that the OER team can provide? Right, so thinking about all of those things when you're doing your, your CFP, including a design document, including accessibility, always good things to think about and keep thinking about as you return to them in those one-on-one -on -one check-ins. Thanks, Al. I think it's a really um, important point that the call for proposals and then later on your memorandum of understanding or your contract we sort of continue to solidify these programmatic choices and clarify the responsibility. You know, is the faculty author going to write the alt tags or is that something you're going to provide? Um, these things will we'll keep touching on them as we move through um, the different elements of building a publishing program. So with two minutes to spare, um, I am going to encourage Veronica and Susan one last time. Julie mentioned that you guys both had outstanding dating profiles. Uh, if you would um, share them in the chat, we would love to see them or share them in the class notes. I think that would be really fun to see what people wrote. Um, so I encourage you to post them or anyone else to post your dating profile in the class notes. Oh, we have one. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Desperately seeking a collaborative and congenial OER curious textbook author for a journey of discovery with an organized and dedicated project manager. Let's work together to make your publishing project a reality. I would totally respond to that ad. Great energy. <laughs> Very fun. All right. Already thinking about equity in your teaching practices? Tired of the inflexibility and lock-in when it comes to picking out your next textbook? Look no further, because working together with my team, we can find, modify, or create new OER materials customized for your class. Just think of all the glowing reviews and jealous looks from your colleagues when you tell them of all your students who are ready with their accessibility design textbook the very first day. Thank you, L. Two inspiring examples that we will end on. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Please join me in thanking Elle and Karen Bjork, our guest presenter today, and I um, will see you next week. Farewell.